Um, I think I'm going to need this mic. I don't have as bold a voice as Mark, but uh, we'll see how we do. Um, yeah, it's an interesting week for this topic with the Leveson Inquiry reporting on the future of the press, of course. No doubt most of you have followed at least some of that. Um, I mean, newspapers, they really are all kind of, we're going to t I'm going to talk today about what might be called the traditional or old press, old media, as opposed to new media. By old or traditional media, I mean newspapers, uh, radio and television. New media, which is increasingly important for all of us, I think, not least MLA, is internet-based. Uh, and it's things like, um, well, special content, content, news content, update content, content directed straight to people's smartphones. It's things like QR codes, which takes you by clicking straight to a web page. I mean, the thing about new media is that, it, that, that you, can, you can get in contact with like-minded people and the general public without newspapers or radio or television as the medium interfering, sifting, censoring, putting their particular slant on it. And I think people want that more and more, and newspapers especially, <clears throat> because of these new technologies and because of problems with attracting sufficient advertising revenue are going to, I think, sink probably in the next 10 years to some extent. Uh, and radio, television, they're more robust. But in the meantime, of course, they're very important because they give us access, a portal to mass market, mass of the public. I mean, looking at newspapers, there are all kinds of things. We've all seen it. They bully and harry the vulnerable. Uh, they can be crude and tr crass. But they also go after the corrupt and the powerful. And they defend the weak. I mean, our job, and I, I don't know how many of you are animal, you count yourself as animal campaigners, but I would have thought most of you are sympathetic. Our job is to intelligently assess what the prospects are and to make the best use we can of the media. I mean, animal rights in the media, they're not, they're not a simple fit. Uh, you would think so because the animal rights message is rational and life-affirming. Uh, and the world would be a saner place if, if it were more widely embraced. The problem is, of course, that um, we challenge, in fact, aim to uproot some fairly cherished social, economic, and cultural assumptions and practices. And that puts people on edge. It threatens them, it threatens institutions. And I think that's something we should always remember if our goal, and it, our goal is to connect rather than alienate. I think back to some of the uh, early leaflets to do with vivisection, because of course, it was vivisection and hunting that were the issues that grabbed people in the 70s. It gave birth to our movement. And, you know, my involvement dates back to the late 70s, early 80s. And when I look, look at some of those leaflets, they seem to me a lesson, some of them, in how to repulse rather than attract. And it wasn't just simply the raw graphics and the cheap production. It was something in, in the way, and I, I don't apply this to all of them, but it was something the way some of them sought to communicate that the anger and frustration and hurt we feel. We were in fact shrieking in the faces of a bemused and ill-informed public. And of course that doesn't work. The public these days are better informed Yet we know there remains uh, a great deal of ignorance. We now also confront, and I think this has grown up in direct response to our successes, and we have had successes. I mean, we know the number of chickens being killed, etc., have gone up, but in terms of the perception, in terms of people's consciousness, I think we have made progress. But because of that, we now 
confront what I would call a cadre of professional liars. They work for animal research interests for the gun lobby, for the farm and slaughter industries, horse racing industries, and so on. And their job is to stand the truth on its head. Animals aren't hurt in laboratories, they tell us, and in any case, uh, you know, animal research produces a ceaseless flow of wonder cures for people. And they tell us that farming and slaughter is a wholesome, well regulated enterprise. And they tell us that horses, when they're whipped, don't feel pain, and in any case, they're whipped in order to keep them safe. Correction, they call it. And they tell us that the production of 50 million pheasants and partridges every year to be shot for sport, and it is sport because most of them aren't caught and eaten, uh, that is environmentally enriching and that it's an efficient food production system. Why do they lie? Because when confronted with that, our, our truths, they have nothing else to offer. The truth hurts and discomforts them. And the truth is very important to us. I mean, one of the many important things I've learned over many years of campaigning is that fidelity to truth and factual accuracy is absolutely paramount. Because if we slip up once, they'll rub our noses in it forever. I should say that even though I've been campaigning for many years, I don't come to you as a perfect exponent. Uh, you'll not be surprised to hear that um, there are many things I could do a lot better. But I have learned from my mistakes over the years, and I've learned from other people's mistakes, both as a campaigner and uh, as a, a journalist. <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit about my previous life before I came to my work. <coughs> I started off an, on an exciting trade journal called Draper in Fashion Weekly. Uh, I moved to Canada and worked on a small publishing house in a small town called Prince George, British Columbia. And I was a sports reporter reporting on sports I'd never even seen, like uh, hockey and lacrosse. And I was there um, logging and building expert. I, I don't know how that happened. But one, once back in the UK, I took up the role of rock writer on New Musical Express. And subsequently, I wrote for a range of titles, including Time Out, New Statesman, The Independent, Guardian, Observer, etc. And I also made a couple of half-hour programs for Radio 4. So over the years, I've developed a reasonable knowledge of what journalists want and need, and I suspect it can be summed up in a handful of words, accuracy, whether or not they did it in it themselves, from others they want accuracy, um, clarity, brevity, novelty, the unexpected, and very important because they're practical people, they've got to put out papers every week or get their news bulletins out at a set time, uh, adherence to deadlines. Before we get to that, I mentioned the perils of shrieking in the faces of, of the amused public. I think it's also a problem if we dollop out too much polish, because excess polish can seem inauthentic, devious even. You know, I sometimes listen or watch advocates for whatever cause it is uh, on the radio or television. Uh, homelessness, uh, anti-racism, and I, I, I think, God, that was incredibly polished and professional, far better than I could do. And then 30 seconds or a minute later, quite often you think, what was the message? I can't remember what it was about. It was just... So what I'm saying is that when slickness substitutes for authenticity, we are in trouble. Because along with that comes a tendency to hold back on the important message in case we lose support or fear of offending. So we, do, we not only if we hold back and be too polished, fail to communicate our clear message, but we give the impression, and we see it in politicians all the time, of being devious and shifty and concealing something. 
I am convinced that even when the public don't agree with the entirety of the, our message, and they often don't, uh, they respect us. If we speak plainly and unapologetically, and they'll move towards us. I'm talking about when we say uncomfortable, non-mainstreamy things like visual pain. We shouldn't make them suffer and kill them so we can eat their flesh. For a lot of people, that's uncomfortable. But when we say things like experimenting on mice is just as immoral as experimenting on monkeys. And even if experimenting on mice did produce benefits for people, which it doesn't because they're the wrong species, it would still be immoral. It might be expedient to use them, but it would be immoral to inflict pain on them. So how do we get the balance right? How do we communicate the horror and injustice without sounding either deranged or fake. I think an obvious first step is to be clear about what it is we're trying to communicate, what it is we feel and want to communicate. There are clearly a multitude of messages that animal activists and ordinary people who don't count themselves as activists but care about something passionately, want to, you know, across the country want to communicate. It might be um, related to a food tasting at a community hall, or perhaps you've gathered some undercover footage uh, from a turkey farm local to you, or a, um, you might have something newsworthy on a local shoot, or a race course, something that troubles you, or perhaps you're supporting a day of action organised by a group such as our own. Whatever the subject matter, the watchwords I listed earlier, I think, very useful guide. They include accuracy, clarity, brevity, sticking to deadlines. I suppose what they combine to produce is trust. Trust with a journalist, very difficult to develop and build, very easily lost. If you drop a journalist in it by offering him or her inaccurate information and that information is published, however tempting it is to over-egg it, we don't say over it, do we? Um, you must resist that, I believe, because if they print inaccurate information, trust in you evaporates. You become remembered as the source that got that journalist abolishing from their editor, or worse, got a legal letter from a solicitor. I mean, I've been on the receiving end of a couple of those when I was a journalist, and even, even when they don't have any merit, they engage uh, a journalist in weeks, perhaps months of hassle work. All the time, they're supposed to be generating copy. I know, I know it's easy to get the impression that all journalists, well, to put it, it's fierce as scum, but um, that's not the case. You've got good and bad, and we're good at make the best of it. Perversely, while journalists expect fidelity to the truth from you, they don't always reciprocate. Uh, as I indicated, I know some intelligent, committed and compassionate journalists, but I also know some who are incompetent and dim and untrustworthy. I think back to uh, the editor of the Sunday tabloid, who uh, at Anilay, who gave him the fruits of a, a major investigation. Um, the, way, the way it was published was that it was the newspapers investigation, they did it, and they came to us for a quote to congratulate them on this marvellous piece of work. Now by the time this editor had executed this manoeuvre, it was late in the day, it was too late, I could either go off an hour or whatever. So I wasn't surprised to hear that um, some years later he was spending quite a lot of time with the police as part of the hacking inquiry. He was working for Murdoch at this time. So what I'm concentrating on today is, is the business of developing useful relationships with journalists, whether in uh, print or broadcast media, and what to expect of them. I thought that would be more useful than looking at um, basic tasks like how to produce a press release or write a letter to the editor. A key thing to remember with journalists is that typically they're ferociously busy. But that doesn't mean you should approach them apologetically, but it does mean you shouldn't waste their time. 
Equally, when you approach a journalist, you must approach them not in the mindset of what they can do for you, but what you can do for them. Because they're not interested in what they can do for you. What they want are stories. They want good stories. They can't survive in the competitive world of media without them. And more and more, they depend on campaigners like ourselves to provide them with good stories. Well packaged, accurate, provoking. Because most journalists, as I've indicated, have very little time to dig around and unearth their own. Newsrooms have been cutting staff for years. In fact, the Independent this week is yet again in trouble and its very rich benefactor owner is looking for support because it's just hemorrhaging money. Um, so, you know, they cut staff and we've now got 24-hour news, multi-platform distribution, so print journalists are having to produce film for the website, so, and, you know, broadcast media and radio media, television and radio media are servicing more and more outlets within their network. I did a mini research um, project a while ago. I don't think things have changed much. I looked at uh, a single edition of the quality uh, broadsheet newspaper and I estimated the source of every single story in it. And apart from um, the world news pages, they tend to have, as you probably spotted, people out in different countries, hotspots. Apart from that, all but a couple of stories were dropped into their lap. Apart from agency copy, they came from the PR departments of commercial companies, they came from central and local government sources, they came from academics promoting a new piece of research, from publishers, TV and film companies, and from advocacy groups like Shelter and Greenpeace. So if you've got a story that can drop comfortably into a journalist's lap, you're useful to that journalist. And if you can deliver good, reliable stories over a period, then you become a valuable contact. And that journalist will start coming to you, whether we're talking Daily Mail, Guardian, or the Hebden Bridge Times. So what is a good story? Well, we've touched on some of the qualities already. Novelty, shock value, tension between competing forces, illegality. They love a bit of illegality. Sometimes they don't see the bigger picture. They just say, is it illegal? Uh, power compromised, and so on. The simple way to determine if you have a good story, I think, is to flick the pages of your local paper or national paper or whatever you're trying to get it into and imagine the issue that you care about that you want to see in that paper. Can you see it in that paper? Can you see a headline? Can you imagine or even map out the first opening paragraphs? Because that is the task you're setting any journalist and the subs. And an equivalent exercise can be conducted with respect to the uh, local or even national radio station or TV station. Can you see it being broadcast? What will be the shape of it? If you can't see it, you haven't got a story. But let's be positive. Let, let, let's say you've got a good story and you're going to offer it as an exclusive. Direct phone contact with um, a journalist is always valuable. It's always good because they, they, you can imagine how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails they get. So direct contact is good. But when you go to them, you need to have what you want said nailed down. You need your material, whether it's in outline note form or a finished press release or whatever it is, or a piece of footage, uh, already. So that when the journalist says, that sounds interesting. Have you got anything to email me? You have. Whether on the phone or in writing, present your material confidently, concisely and accurately. Don't make speeches of them. I'm sorry if these are a series of edicts, but I can't think of another way of doing it. Don't make speeches of them because just as they don't want you don't want to be the source that dropped them in it and got them a bollocking. You don't want to be the source that talks and talks. 
because they'll stop, not, they won't answer the phone to you. As I say, they're busy, but don't be put off if they're grumpy. I think journalists have seen too many films where the reporters are terribly butch and brusque, and I think they have to play the part. But don't be put off, it's just the way they are, and it's a stressful business. It's also important to deal with them straight. Avoid the temptation to play one journalist off against another, thinking you can get a better spread or a better piece on a radio station, because when they find out, and they will, they won't appreciate it. And perhaps more important, don't hold back information that you think weakens your story, that will scupper it. Because if they do find it out, and they have to go to their news editor and say, that story I've worked on all day or all week, it fell flat. I couldn't stand it up because this twit just told me so-and-so. That's an embarrassment to them and a problem for you. Which brings us to deadlines, I guess. If you're dealing regularly with particular media outlets, it's useful to find out when their especially rushed times are, you know, when their morning conferences or if they're 10 minutes you know, deeply agitated before they go on air, that kind of thing. And obviously avoid contacting them at those times. They don't want to be talking about next week's story when they're on deadline. Now, I spoke earlier about the problems that defamation can bring a journalist. And I would say if there's no real imperative for them to print a contentious story that names an offender, they'll play safe and go with that and, and not go with that. And with that in mind, if you can get your I mean sometimes what we dig up, we found a particularly disgusting example of, I don't know, a chicken farmer or butcher or whatever it might be, or a local piece of animal experimentation. If you can make the case without naming individuals or institutions, it's always best to because, you know, when the, whoever receives your material receives it, sees names, especially if it's a letter to the editor, they've got, they've got time to check it, they'll bin it. So if you're doing a letter to the editor, and many, many of you will, I know, or post stuff on blogs. In fact, my wife posted something. No, it wasn't her. She saw it. Somebody posted something on a blog last night which made a, a, a statement about, you know, all researchers don't just take money from drug companies. And so, yes, probably true in many, many, many cases. But if you say it, you're actually defaming a particular research group, which is what was so they pulled it. So they'll take the easy route and pull stuff or not use it if you're naming people and you haven't given them time to double check. Um, that brings me to the vivisection issue. I mean, Animal Aid, we do very well with media. Uh, we, we, uh, a lot of that is to do... It's difficult to talk about it without sounding conceited, but the quality of work we do and the way we approach handling the media, the double, triple, quadruple checking, we've got some very special specialists like Dean Stancer, our horse racing consultant at the back there. You know, he does a lot of very special investigations and reports and analysis for us. And after time, they get to trust us. But vivisection, section, and we do well with horse racing, shooting, we've been doing well with even veganism especially at a local level, CCTV, many of you will know our campaign on CCTV. That's based on some very hard work in the office and some very brave undercover by um, our undercover agent. I don't know how he does it, but he got to nine slaughterhouses and came back with some fantastic footage, gruesome, that appeared on all the main networks and all the national uh, newspapers. But getting vivisection stuff is very difficult presents a whole unique set of problems. The subject, those of you who have followed these issues, will know has been a battlefield over a number of years, during which time we've seen animal researchers getting more and more direct support from government. Very few areas are so misrepresented in the media as animal research, whether in time, in terms of the alleged benefits it produces for human medicine, the degree of suffering, terrible, deliberate suffering inflicted on animals, 
or the true extent of uh, the opposition by the public. Uh, media coverage of a recently published Ipsos Mori poll, I don't know if, how many of you saw that, uh, but that seriously underplayed the opposition to animal research. I did not see reported, for instance, that a clear majority of under 25 year olds now oppose animal research, all animal research. And that depending on how you frame the question, a majority, um, if you take all age groups and all, all sectors, opinion is evenly divided. I mean, typically, most of the questions I ask in such polls are things like, uh, do you support medical research if there are no alternatives? Well, that's a loaded question. And they can still, because there are alternatives, and they can still only get 60-something <coughs> percent. I mean, many times animal aid has gone to the media with powerful evidence of vivisection scientific failure and its pathological cruelty. And I mean pathological. I knew a report on GM mice um, based on published papers reveals the most shocking stuff. Mice programmed genetically to suffer seizure after seizure and then die, to attack their own bodies and kill themselves, to backflip attention hyperactive deficit disorder, backflip, 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 non-stop. I mean, this is sadism. And that's just the start, that's just producing them, and then they inflict terrible torments on them. You know, shock, electric shocks, depriving them of their mothers, dripping water on them. Now, we should be able to get this in front of the public, but it still remains difficult. Um, I mean, our Victims of Charity report, which we published, when was it? I think it was last June. We did well with that, especially when it was launched. We got into about 200 different media outlets. And I'm encouraged to see that um, some uh, important regional daily newspapers are conducting their own freedom of information requests and are able to uh, expose the true level of experimentation in their local universities. And they're shocked. You know, we're talking 30,000 30, plus a year in, in, in their local universities. <coughs> Um, the rawness of the animal research, sorry, the rawness of, of the vivisection issue still means that if there is any hint of someone being t mentioned, the journalist fears, I believe, that they'll be targeted and they'll get the blame. I think this is at the heart of a lot of it. But it's very difficult, of course, to talk about a specific piece of research without naming the researcher. But what I'm saying to you is, if you can convey the meaning, the essence, and even point to, in an MB, the team, without saying, mis you know, flagging them up, more chance of getting it published. Uh, it, it, it is a good idea to, instead of us being the medium, to encourage newspapers or radio to initiate their own debates on this issue. Um, you know, discussion for and against, etc., rather than it being them feeling that they're the dupes of animal rights people. And the second thing I'd say is if you're sending animal research background to media, send it in good time before you go public with it because they need plenty of confidence and time to process it. So. Um, what you will need in all your dealings with the media is persistence. What you were convinced was worthy of a big spread or lots of airtime will be rejected, or if it's used, the salient facts, and uh, your message will be scrambled. That'll happen except for the times it doesn't. And then there's enormous satisfaction at achieving your objective, which of course is to speak out on behalf of animals. There are real opportunities out there. If we put ourselves in the shoes of the people we're approaching and think, what is it they want? How do I give it to them so they feel comfortable, they've got a good story, and they don't feel panicked about lawsuits? That's the heart of it. For, their, for the animal's sake, we've got to stick at it, we've got to be effective, we've got to think long term, and we've got to prepare. Um, I've got a favourite little saying of a champion tennis player. Arthur Ashe from the 1960s and 1970s, 
the first, I think the only black man to win uh, a singles title at Wimbledon. He said the key to performance, and obviously he was talking about tennis, but it could just as easily apply to writing a letter to the paper or making a phone call that you find difficult. The key to performance is confidence. And the key to confidence is preparation. So if you prepare without over-preparing, you know, without being up all night and working yourself into a frazzle, and if you give it your best shot, well, that's the best you can do. We all mess up sometimes, but we've all got to remember that, um, well, there will be better days in more ways than one. Thank you. Five Live, Victoria, Derbyshire, 10 to 12, Tuesday, Tuesday. Any other observations or questions? Later there. Uh, more observation than a question. I mean, you mentioned several times how busy journalists are. Um, one of the bits of feedback I've had back when I've had work published is that they really like to have it ready to go. So without typos, without mistakes, and in the same style as the other things in that newspaper. Uh, without lots of technical terms that people from the area won't understand. So, you know, if you can do that for them, again, they're more likely to publish it and come back to you for more stuff. If they haven't got to spend some of their time doing, doing rewriting and correction work. That's it. So what are you what are you referring to? Is this an article you wrote for... I've them? got a couple of pieces in The Guardian, and I was quite oh, yeah. surprised that it seemed quite easy to get stuff in The Guardian. And the feedback I got from the journalists was, well, I don't have to rewrite your stuff. So Excellent. So where did that appear in The Guardian? It was, was it online? Or it was the online, online local government and environment pages. Excellent. Well, there is... Well, that's an accomplishment. And I mean, there, the fact is, the, the web, the web, and as we know, all dailies and weeklies have their web pages, and they're voracious. Uh, they, they, they're just, there's just an unending demand. So there is, a, there, I mean, obviously, we want to get in the places where lots of people see it. I think we've got to think of a world in which um, we don't communicate with hundreds of thousands of people all at once necessarily, but we make enough contact and start spreading, you know, the message. Right over there. Um, would you agree that it's important, when we do stuff about the deception, generally the public are interested in the health and not always too bothered about the animal suffering because they've been told that it's necessary to get the cures. Um, when we do articles, always we get the scientists coming back saying, we can't do this any other way, this is going to be like this. Should we be trying to present the alternatives, because they are out there, but the science against the experiment, which will convince people much more, I know Central Medicine does that quite a lot, and tries to get that across, but if we don't present the alternative science, it, or if, well, sorry, I'll say, rephrase that, if we do present that science, it will be harder for the, for the scientific people to shoot this down. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. Um, the, I mean, the trouble with this debate and all, all, all debates on different <coughs> aspects of uh, animal use and abuse is that it doesn't proceed in a r r rational manner. And a lot, of, a lot of it is bona fides. I mean, I often think, you know, where are the areas, for instance, that <coughs> we, we, are, we are considered competent to speak on? We consider competent to speak on cruelty. We struggle to convince third parties that we're competent to speak on science, even though we've had a succession of very good science consultants. I wonder if Andre's here. Uh, and our current um, 
uh, Dr. Adrian Stallwood. It is difficult, but I think it's essential to stress that um, people suffer as well, absolutely. Because people are self-interested. That gentleman, he comes to you. Yeah, I mean, this, you do, do hear it argued that you, you say 95% of the time it doesn't work, 5% it does. I say, well, what about the 5%? Well, you know, if a plane crash, if a model of a plane crash 95 times out of 100, you wouldn't want to go up in it, hoping it'd be a month's food. The thing about any research methodology is it's got to be reliably predictive, not occasionally right. And when it's occasionally right, that's... Um, <coughs> despite the fact that it's not a sound, stable, predictive, trustworthy methodology. When we're dealing with people's health, which is what medicine is supposed to be, you need a, a reliably predictive method of generating data. That's the point. We, we don't use, at least we, it's easy to slip into it, <coughs> we attempt to avoid the term alternatives because it gives legitimacy to animal experiments, is what you're saying. So we, we talk about non-animal methods. And, um, I think, when, when are we supposed to pack up? Uh, if we give it another two, three minutes, yeah. has, has anyone got a gentleman? Yeah, just, um, have you got any suggestions how we can get the issue into the mainstream media when we're being completely stonewalled. I'll just put this in context. Are we talking for this section again? Yes. We're okay. in, I'll, I'll put it in context for you. We're trying to get into French media um, regarding Air France, who are the number one transporter of lab animals worldwide. We presented on three different occasions dossiers to journalists, massive interest, and then we're getting stonewalled. At a certain point, the editors say we're not discussing this. Um, I'm kind of wondering if you've got any way we can break through this. I mean, Air France is very powerful. We know they have a lot of influence. Um, we really just cannot get through it. They won't even, they won't even discuss it. We've even had an article in the Air France Air Stewards uh, magazine, but we haven't got into the major media in any way. 
Have you got any suggestions how we can break that barrier? It's very difficult. I think part of it is the source. Now, I don't know anything about you, and I'm proud of our movement, and I know people take different approaches. But the common view is that if they start printing such and such stuff, they're playing the game of extremists. So what I, what I was saying earlier is that if you can encourage them to facilitate their own investigation, give them tips, support them, so that the story is not such and such a group says such and such and they're disgusted and they're going to do such and such, but whatever the paper is, Perry, not Perry much, it's a fancy, whatever it is, um, Le Monde, I suppose. Um, you know, a Le Monde investigation has uncovered such and such. Our problem here is that Air France even released a, a press release that they sent out to all the major media uh, organisations to say, yes, we transport lab animals, we do it because we have to, we follow the CICES regulations, we follow the IACA regulations, blah, blah, blah. It didn't get published. There's no, there's no denying that they're the number one transports of animals. There's no, there's no ambiguity to our sources even. They even admit it themselves. Other papers, I think the story at the moment is not about, I mean, the way the story is being conveyed. It's not about the suffering. It's not about the issue of animal use, and, and, and uh, it, it's about the tension, the conflict between those who want the trade to continue and those who don't. And it's very difficult to get it off that, and that is the task. So if you can generate, I mean we know from the hard experience that the, our opponents will want to make it about us uh, and not about the issue. So if you can come up with some fresh, maybe you know, uh, revelations about the nature of the trade, the suffering, the nature of deaths in transit, their fate on arrival, and somehow divert and, 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 and get um, an accredited uh, specialist in the field to declare that this is a problem. Yeah. Good to get it off you versus them. We've, again, we've had uh, PUAV recently for uh, an investigation they the Southern Bureau around uh, Air France for Sole Transport. So there's actually a couple of um, charter airlines that occasionally transport five minutes to the um, we've, we've had that. We've had the PUAV video footage of five minutes on the Air France KLM cargo plane. They simply it, they won't touch it for, for political reasons, and that's really our problem there. And it, we, it might, it might. we have journalists who are interested and they, they tell us we're going to run the story. And then they actually come to us very humble and say, uh, yeah, sorry, it kind of got pulled. And, um. Well, that, that is probably the reality because we've seen the coverage, in, you know, particularly the tabloids in this country. The reality of the French media might be that they're not going to go with it at the time. Maybe you need to think about other routes through to the public. And, you know, in increments of 100 instead of increments of 400,000. Yeah. And it's a, it's a slog. But that, that is why I say the old media is going to pack up some. The old media is, is riding for fault because not only it's got technology and economics against it, it's got the fact that it does intervene and mediate and silence and censor. And what people want are very people go nuts on the internet and say foul things. People want an opportunity to speak to each other on media. And I think with all of us got to think about new media, as tempting as it is to think, oh, I got, you know, that piece in, you know, Daily Mail or something. I think that's a lesson. Let's be ahead of it and not behind it. So thank you very much. I hope you're enjoying the fair. Lovely to see you. And uh, let's